Uh, it looks like we're going to start up at 1210. How's everyone doing? Good. For those who don't know, my name is James Stewart. I'm the emergency manager coordinator here in Seldovia. And I've also, prior to that, for six years, I was a medic in the Army. So I have a background in first aid. I've used it. Um, and I think it's an incredible skill you need to learn and have on hand at all times. So today we're just going to go over first aid, not only just the uses, but if you got to have a small toolkit, if you don't already have one, five things they recommend having and why we have them, we'll use it. We'll go over the uses of them. And my model back there, Mark, if you come up here, we'll demonstrate with it. So without further ado, here we go. So everyone understands why, what's the importance of having first aid? Can anyone think of a time you needed first aid at your house? I know you have Abby, so. Yes. More once. than once? Yes, more than once. Absolutely. So yeah, first aid, you're more likely, more than three times likely to get injured at home than anywhere else. Whether you're doing home improvement projects or simply just walking around, you need to have first aid knowledge to have some form of kit. You also need to know where it is and what's in it. So what's one thing, and if you have any questions or any comments, feel free to just interject. I'll stop talking right away and we'll get to it. But what's one thing that you probably should check on your first aid kit? What do you think, Rick? Anything that's expirable. Absolutely, expiration dates. So that's something people forget. Equipment, although it's like you kind of look at like a gauze, like can it expire? It can't it be expired. When it expires, it becomes weak. It does not absorb it. It really is not that useful. But something else you should check. Purple antibiotic equipment. Yes, why? Wow. So something like that is you're gonna check is like where you can use it, where you can't use it. That's kind of segue. Most first aid equipment, like the antibiotic, don't use around the eyes or face. So you gotta look at like what the, we call them contraindications. So what the contraindications are for the equipment and how to use it. Like for example, a tourniquet. Use, everyone know what a tourniquet is? I'll show it real quick. This is something they have. You can have it's a tourniquet. It's used to stop bleeding. Where would you not want to use a tourniquet? Probably the neck. I've seen people use it on the neck before. Obviously not effective, you're not saving anyone's life that way. So this is only gonna be used on the extremities. So you have to understand not only what the equipment you have the uses for, but also what you shouldn't use it for. And a permanent marker, make sure it always works. If yeah. you're using it for marking your times on the tourniquet. Absolutely, and where do you wanna put the marking the times? Do you wanna put it on the tourniquet? So, so what we kind of use, and this is what we use in the middle, you don't have to, is we put it on their forehead. Hmm. So if you're using a tourniquet, they're already in a bad situation, they're probably going to a hospital, they're going to eventually cut the tourniquet off. So they might not see the times. So that's why you're not going to put it above or below, because it's probably where the area is affected, it's where it's hurt, so it's probably, probably a little messy there. So we kind of say if it's on the right arm, we'll like take a big piece of tape, which is something we'll cover, we'll put a big piece of tape on it, and we'll put TQ, which is abbreviation for tourniquet, and the time was placed, and then honestly we'll put a time on their forehead, and people kind of understand that's when the tourniquet is applied. And get off on a tangent, we'll talk about it on the next slide. So I have, I know I have PowerPoint, and I'm hoping no one was all, all bummed out when I saw PowerPoint up here. We're not going to really do a death by PowerPoint. They're just going to kind of keep me on target so I don't go off on tangents. Mark knows I go off on tangents a lot. He gets me all riled up talking about the Coast Guard. Um, <laughs> Sometimes tangents are good. Yeah. I was not going to mention that. Mark likes to say the Coast Guard is part of the military. They're not. Homeland Security. No, they're uh, Homeland Security. It's neither here nor there. But, um, so yeah, so that's why we're here. Well, we're only going to reference this kind of to make sure I'm keeping on target. So yeah, first aid's important because the response time, especially where we live in the isolated area of Seldovia, how quick do you think that response time is? Very critical. Very critical. Absolutely. You need that response time, especially if you're bleeding, you're having a lot of pain, or like it's, it's broken, you need to get someone out there quick. So that's why... Typically 45 minutes from the time the call gets in before someone is out. And how quickly can you bleed out? If it's an arterial bleed, it's an artery, one of the biggest bleeds. Five minutes. Two to three. If it's a femoral artery, you can bleed out in two to three minutes. So that's why first aid is critical, especially in Seldovia. We're going to have 45 minute response time, two to three minutes before so you've gone too far. Does anyone have any questions on why we need first aid? I feel like it's pretty self explanatory, but just in case. All right, awesome. Right, so we're going to go over five simple items today. Um, and when I say five slides, we're going to touch on a couple more. So first thing we go over is gauze. Gauze is about a million uses. It's phenomenal. You can use it from simple small bleeds to uh, packing a wound. If someone has like a something going on, you can actually improvise like a, a wrap for an impalement. We're going to go over trauma shears, the importance of trauma shears, why you need scissors. And people kind of look at it like, oh, we're doing arts and crafts. No, you need scissors because what's something you need to do to treat a wound? You don't cut them. Yes. You also need to see where it is. So if I got hurt with my leg and I have jeans on, I would just cut all the way up. And it's, it's very painful to kind of take the jeans off so you can just cut the clothing away and you can see the injury itself. 
If you look at the triangle bandage, people don't understand this cloth or anything like that. It needs to be improvised. But improvised foam, anything. If you have a tablecloth or a bandana, these are phenomenal. And these are these are good for a lot of things. We're going to go over splinting as well. And then we're going to go over tape. We have tape. We'll talk about tape a little bit. Also securing the uh, securing the interventions. What we'll call them. And the last thing we go over, especially where we live, is an emergency blanket, blizzard blanket, wool blanket, whatever you have, something that can keep you warm. All right. Next slide. We we use we use Scotch eighty eight. Scotch eighty eight. I think that makes you feel warm, but I don't know if you're actually warm. It stops the bleeding. <laughs> and it holds together. That's fair. All right. I also don't want to say next slide, which kind of talk to myself on that one. But first thing we go over is gauze. So everyone has gauze. Everyone knows it comes in loose. It was like kind of four by four cloth. So it comes in like this. So a gauze, bunch of uses. And so we're going to go over, there's actually three types of bleeding. Does anyone know that? Has anyone seen this before? So you look at injuries, you're looking at three types of bleeding. Capillary, that's kind of like your small, like I fell, hit my knee, it's a little bleeding, it's kind of just like bright red, it's oozy, it's, it's honestly, sometimes you put a bandage on it, it's that in, in consequence. But it's important to know because it affects kids, you want to have a bandage on, you put a bandage on it, you're good to go. But post venous, or uh, capillary, you're looking at venous bleeding. Can anyone tell me where that comes from? Looking at the name. Veins. Veins. Veins, awesome, yes. The man in the blood red shirt. Perfect. <laughs> so you're looking at bleeding from the veins. And with that, well, how do you think we're going to handle and tackle that issue when you're bleeding, they have that venous bleeding issue? Absolutely right. And I'm sorry, ma'am, your name is? Mary Jo. Mary Jo, phenomenal answer. So yeah, pressure. You're going to want to put, take the gauze. And what I like about having it like this is you can take the gauze, you can wrap the wound, and then you kind of use the rest it's almost like a pressure ball, so you're not pushing randomly. So you actually can, and when Mark gets a chance, I'm gonna bring him up, we're all gonna clap, kind of embarrass him a little bit. But yeah, so for right now, first example, Mark, come on down. Um, Have a seat. So Mark's here demonstration. So say Mark has some veins bleeding on his arm. He's playing with, he's running with scissors like he's not supposed to. They start bleeding. You're not supposed to? He's all red. He must be bleeding everywhere. <laughs> Turn it to that. So you're just going to honestly say, take it. You identify the wound. You can wrap it. But then you take the extra. Say if you notice it, you can almost twist it and then hold down almost like it's a pressure ball. It's easy to use. Gives you a good point. And it's there for extra, extra absorbing. So that's something you can do with gauze as well. And that's what you're going to get with kind of a, a venous bleed. It's going to be a little more, it's going to be, it's going to be fluid. It's not going to be stopped with a bandit. But it's not going to be life threatening in that two minute time frame we talked about. And now the last one, arterial bleeding. Did anyone guess where that comes from? That's from a deep artery. A deep artery. And those are the ones you're terrified of. Those are the ones having to be ripped out of the shop or someone's out of the shop messing around. And one of those vehicles that's on, on jacks falls down, and that can cause an arterial bleed. Has anyone seen a tourniquet before? Awesome. I'm going to pass them out just so you can get some hands on if you want. So how many times can you use a tourniquet? How many have you used one? How many times can you use one? Once. I think once. One time. And what, how, when can you take, say you put a tourniquet on someone, when can you take it off? Never. You let the doctor do it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, you're about to be blackballed from answering questions. You're too good. Uh, yeah, once you put the tourniquet on, you do not take it off. So, yeah, so a tourniquet is used to stop any serious bleeding. And where can you use the tourniquets? The extremities. You're not going to use it around the waist. You're not going to use it. You're going to put it anywhere on the arms or the legs. So when we when we kind of learn tourniquet use and we kind of go to the goal has always been there's two areas you can do it. if it's kind of a hasty tourniquet you put on immediately you just see Mark's arm it's a big red mess you're gonna do high and tight so you're gonna go as high as you can and as tight as you can so important to recognize this we call this the tail this portion of the tail we call this the windlass we call this the climb you know, there's a bunch of terminology but this is kind of what I'll use if there's any questions if I say something you don't understand let me know. So we're gonna go high and tight on the arm. So right up there at the top of the arm. 
We're going to feed that tail through. And I'm not, I don't want to hurt him because I like him. And he signs my time sheets. And then you're going to tighten the windlass. Normally the rule is three spins. Why do you think we only want to do three spins? You might have to tighten it more. You don't want to tighten it off too much. You want to let some flow, but not all. No, you want to stop flow completely. You want to stop. Yeah, your goal is to stop flow completely. The biggest thing is it's plastic. You don't want to break this, this windlass right here. Yeah, so you want to stop flow because you need blood and you need to keep it in your core area. We also don't want to break this plastic piece right here. So if you've noticed you can't get it down with three Titans, then I recommend you kind of take it off and make sure this portion is tied. So if anyone wants a chance, we can come up, you can put a straight on my arm, see how you guys do. If you're interested in doing that. I'll be, I'll be the test dummy, I will do that to Mark. So we just take a turn, put the tourniquet on, make sure there's a good feel, and I'll let you know. You can see my hand, I know it's already pretty, you were way too excited. <laughs> yeah, so you're gonna put it right here, we're gonna do high and tight. There you go. I so feel like that means we're giving you a haircut though. Oh, tight. yeah, hat. <laughs> high and tight. So when you put the tourniquet on, where do you kind of want to keep the windlass? Out, out, out. On the outside, because that person's probably in pain, they're gonna be flailing on, they might actually knock it if you put it close to the inside. So you're gonna want to get, make sure this is nice and tight. You're gonna kind of almost ratchet it down. You can put it on more, if I can still. Make sure you had a good feeling. Well, if you don't want to. I've had it. Yeah, so that's kind of like you'll see is you get that delay capillary refill in my hand. Yeah. And that's when you know the blood's good and cut off, and that's what you want. And then if you want to double check, you can always see if there's a pulse. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's not, and that's good. Okay. Awesome. All right, I'm ready? Do your other arm so we don't make oh, pass know. out, you know. I've got plenty, I promise. <laughs> you can just sit that down. You want to ratchet that? There you go. Yeah, no, you're fine. There you go. And then look. Not really returning. There you go. Yeah, it's simple as that. Not too easy. Just pop it like that. So if these weren't used for training, they'd stay on, and then you would never use them again. All right. Do you have any questions on tourniquets? How expensive are those? It depends on where you go. If you go on Amazon, they're in between twelve to. You can get a pack of what ten for twenty. Yeah, I guess five for twenty. Five for twenty. So yeah, so it all depends. When you're looking at um, there's a bunch of brands. I always go to, uh, I mean, I don't try to go too cheap because you want them to last, but they're called CAT, so combat application tourniquets, and those have always been pretty useful. It's what we use in the Army, and they're uh, they're pretty good. The blue ones, if you see blue ones, those are actually meant for training and training only. So I had my aunt bought a bunch of tourniquets because I talked to her about it, and she wasted about $50 on blue training tourniquets, so I kind of had to explain that to her. So don't buy blue, uh, black would be good to go. So next thing you do is we're still talking about bleeding. Where else? You don't just bleed from your arms, right? You bleed from everywhere in your body. So when you have a head wound, what's something you need to be cautious of the head wound? What's up on the head? Unless Mark, unless you're Mark. You got a brain up there. <laughs> so you got a brain up there. So when you're, and, and if you have a brain, you have that swelling, what are you kind of worried about? And this is kind of more of advanced stuff. It's called intracranial pressure. Worry about swelling. So when you have a head wound, they're going to be heavy bleeders, but that's, always, that's not always an indication of a serious injury, no matter what you're going to eat back on. So when you wrap a head wound, always make sure you're not tightening it, you're not tourniqueting it, you're not putting way too much. You want to get make sure there's material on it, make sure you're doing everything you can control the bleeding. You're not putting too much pressure on the head itself. You also want to avoid me covering their eyes. It can distort them, that can cause any issues. And again, like we talk about those contraindications, what are you looking for when someone has a head wound? Consciousness. Consciousness, you're looking at their eyes, seeing if one's dilated or one's not. Their ears, it's almost as clear fluid as cerebral, CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. 
that's indication. And that's something you can tell to a 911 when you call. Be like, hey, there's this weird, clear substance coming out. Or they have one eyes are dilated, or there's kind of a, it's called nystagmus. It's a twitching of the eyes. That's a, a serious indication of another brain injury. So there's things you're going to look at. And there's also fun things you can do. Say I was playing, uh, have you ever heard of the game Air Roulette? Kids play it, shoot an arrow up in the air, and you just try to dodge it. It's a very dumb game, don't recommend it. But say something happens where you get hit with an arrow. You need, you're not going to remove that from it, you're going to leave it in there, but you need to find a way to stabilize it. You can take gauze, if you have big hands like I do, you wrap it a couple times around your hand, and then you just start making it, we call it a donut. So then you just kind of wrap it around and it feeds itself. And you can watch, but then essentially you're making just a donut to stabilize whatever you need. And then you can pack the rest of the other gauze. So gauze has a thousand different uses. It's very effective and it's something I recommend. And if you have that four by four, those small sheets, those are good, but I also recommend looking and getting some of this gauze, some rolled out gauze. They also sell like this, which is a lot easier to manage. You just kind of pop that tab and it comes out slowly so you're not losing gauze on the ground. It's not getting too dirty. You can just slowly pull it out. This is effective. You kind of keep it. So this is my own, this is my own little like uh, first aid kit. It's a, it's a fanny pack so I can wear it while I'm hiking. No shame in me. No issue wearing a fanny pack at all. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions, cuts on, any questions about gauze or any bleeding? Why do you think we go over bleeding first in? And why it's so important. Well, it's critical because, like you say, you bleed out, it's over. Yes, you need your blood. And you can bleed from anywhere on the body, and it's very dangerous if you bleed a lot. It's called hypovolemic shock. And once you enter it, it's very difficult to get you back. All right, triangle bandage. Um, and the weirdest thing is splinting. You can also use it as an improvised tourniquet. Say so you don't have one of these cool nifty tourniquets like I do. You can take this and you can wrap around the room, tighten it as much as you can. That's a good way to use it. Improvise as a tourniquet. Um, sling. So, Mark, if you don't mind coming down one more time, bring over how to make and use a sling. So, what happens? Why do you think you want to sling? Help stabilize. You want to stabilize. So, once you get it stabilized, you're also going to check for that pulse. So, say Mark broke his arm. You want to stabilize that arm, and then you want to check for a pulse. If you don't find a pulse, that means they got to get treatment very quickly. So the first thing is you're going to have your triangle bandage. Just call it that way because it looks like a triangle. And you're going to take this end. And you're going to tie it in now. <clears throat> if you can't follow along, I do have a fancy little slide behind me that shows what's going on. So you can tie it in now. Then you're going to take, ask him if, hey, if you can't, you should put your arm like this. So you're going to, as gently as you can, slide this first portion up underneath, making sure his arm is in that basket right there. And then you're gonna take the second portion and bring it around. You're gonna tie, preferably a non-slip knot. And if you want to, you can always tighten it, you can always, but that's gonna kind of act as Mark sling right there. And then once you do that, you're gonna check for pulse, make sure he's there, make sure nothing's wrong. So that's kind of a way to sling. I can untie it if anyone wants to try it. Just get a hands on it all. Good, awesome, yeah, it's, it's not too hard, but it's very important. Does anyone know what an anatomical splint is? That's where you're using your own body to splint? Absolutely, so that's something you get, how, how would you sling a leg? So say someone broke a leg, how would you put, how would you put that in a sling? The other leg. Yeah, you can't. So you have to use that anatomical splinting. So you're going to take the unaffected leg, move it closer, and you're going to tie the broken leg to it. Not to you. I don't want you to lay down on the ground. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So yeah, so <laughs> anatomical splinting. Also, if you're in a pinch, you can actually use something like this because the fabric it's made of. It's not too bad. And honestly, I know it's it's kind of it can be dirty, but when there's a situation where you need to use this as a form of gauze, they're going to a hospital, they're going to get antibiotics. So don't necessarily worry about making sure everything's sterile or anything like that, because they'll get antibiotics pushed in them. Also, probably the way they injure themselves isn't necessarily sterile measure to begin with. You're good. Yeah, you're good. Appreciate good. it. I know you're eating lunch. Yep. He only came here for the moose stew, as I was told. <laughs> so yeah, so that's called it. That's just, that's why it's important. You can work on bones, you can tie legs together. That's why it's always good to have one of these on hand. All right. 
Okay, is there any other questions on that? None? All right. Scissors. And we kind of touched on it at the beginning. What's the importance of scissors? Why do we use them? Um, and then is it just any regular old scissors, any of those like those uh, fancy, what type of scissors do you think we need? Crab, crab, crab scissors. Yeah, so there any form that pretty much has a blunt bottom end. And I'll walk around. So this is what I'm talking about. This is the blunt bottom end. So yeah, anything with a nice blunt bottom end is good to go. Nice. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like said, you don't want to stab them. You don't want to take just like a uh, fabric shears. Next thing you know, you have a cut from here to here when it's a small one. So that's why it's important to have these. So one of the biggest things is you want to be able to see the injury itself. And scissors, and you don't necessarily have to cut up the entire leg, but you can make a small incision, just cut right there. And especially if it's cold out, you want to keep some clothing on them. So scissors allow you to do that. How do you see what the wound is? See what's going on, see what you're treating. So that comes back to the tourniquets. So there's ways to do it where you put the high and tight like I talked about, Mark. But then once you're able to cut away and see the wound, where do you think you should put the tourniquet? Above it. Just above it. Above it. So you're looking at two to three inches above the wound. But where would you say I got a hair on my arm, like right here? Where would I not want to put it? Right. You don't want to put it on the elbow. And then in some situations where it's a very bad issue, you have to put it on two to three inches, but it has to be on viable flesh. So you have to make sure the entire arm around is good to go. So you're gonna go, you're gonna cut up and you're gonna see the wound and you're gonna put two to three inches above, not on a joint and on viable tissue is what we say. So that's why it's such important. It allows you to really understand the situation and one of the biggest things you can do in first aid, what do you think one's the most important things you can do in first aid? Absolutely, first things first, never do any more harm. We have to pass along information to the people that are responding. So they're prepared to respond, they know what they need, they know what they need to prepare, uh, prep, like what uh, equipment they need to prep. So scissors are great at doing that. It's also, if you have multiple people injured or you don't want to use all this gauze, you can cut the gauze with scissors. You're not sitting there trying to tear it or pump with it. It's not, it doesn't tear that easily. So scissors are great for also just utilizing and mitigating the waste of supplies. All right. And then tape. It's kind of a jack of all trades type of tool. It's, I think tape is phenomenal. Um, when you use tape, what type of tape do you think we're talking about? Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you have it, if, you, if that's all you have, sure. But recommend using first aid tape. Whatever. First aid tape. And what, some of the good things about the first aid tape is it's normally it's good. As, it's waterproof. And why do you think that's important? Why do you think that's why do you think you need some form of waterproof or almost liquid proof tape? Because of blood, if you're putting it on somebody, the way it's bleeding, you want it to stick. Blood slippery. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of a combination of what Mark and Rick said. There's blood, you want to make sure that tape's sticking, you want to make sure it's a good adhesive. And you so, can rip it with your hands without needing scissors. Yes. It's easy to yeah, tear. Yeah, it's easy to break. Yeah. Duct tape is as well. Yeah, so the sides of tape are easy to tear, but itself is fairly strong. So one, one time tip we use, and one thing we always look forward is, we always just call dog earring our tape. So you don't want to be kind of there fumbling, trying to find the start of the tape. Like, so we always take the end piece, we just give it a little, little fold over on itself, which is dog ear. It's the easiest way. When you're done with it, you're good to go. So you don't just use tape for treatment. You also say, you put the tourniquet on, you put the tourniquet on, you also can take it and you tape down. So once the windlass is in here, you can tape that down as well. So you just kind of wrap around the arm, tape the arm. It almost looks like one of those old barbershop poles. And that secures the windlass so that in case they're moving or gets bumped on something, it doesn't pop off. You also use it to tape down gauze, which is phenomenal. And you can also use it, like I said, so you have a lot larger tape on those bigger rolls. See, they're hurt on their left, uh, right hand side. You can put it on their left hand side, and you can put like TQ uh, 1215 on um, gauze, and you can just type, write down what you did. So when you have the ambulance gets there or the helicopter, whoever's responding, you're not trying to just remember everything you did. You can actually be like, hey, I did X, Y, and Z based off of what I've written down. It's very easy to do. It's, it's super useful. And if you have a Sharpie, there should be no problem. The last thing is a blizzard blanket and emergency blanket. Why do you think that's an important thing on the top five we have? Because you live in Alaska and it's cold. So when you're bleeding, what happens to your body? It goes into a shutdown. 
So essentially, when you bleed and when you lose a lot, you're not able to regulate, you're losing all that heat as well. So does anyone know the temperature of blood? So your body, your 97.8 is kind of ideal. Blood runs about 100.4. So that's why true fever is anything over 100.4. But blood's right around, so blood's warm. And blood helps to uh, keep you warm and everything like that. So when you bleed a lot, when you lose a lot of blood, you're losing a lot of heat as well. So you can go into hypothermia is one of the serious issues that go along with blood loss and an injury. You get injured in the, you can get injured in Afghanistan, it's 100 degrees out, we have them shivering, they're cold, you have to get them wrapped up in a blizzard blanket. So imagine here, it's 30 degrees out, you're injuring, you're in the cold, you're in the snow, ground's even colder. You need to have that way to keep it warm. So there's plenty of things to do. We call them blizzard blankets, emergency blankets. You can have those uh, hand warmers. Those can easily put them in there. Wool blanket's the best option. If you have a wool blanket in your truck, I keep this in, our, in my car. You want to keep wool blankets, just any means to be prepared to stay warm in a cold situation, especially if they're injured. Yes. Also, the adrenaline response that you know a lot of people after an injury, the adrenaline gets pumping and they get the shakes, you know, and the, the whole shock situation. But um, you know, they feel like they're cold even if they're not actually cold because of the adrenaline. Yeah, absolutely. Also, something with a with the adrenaline is like sometimes you don't know how bad the situation is. So, if like an example, like an amputee. Their, their muscles and everything in the leg tends to tense up and spasm. And bleeding it won't necessarily come out right away. It'll be bleeding, obviously, but it won't be nearly as bad until like a couple seconds later, a little bit later, once the body reacts. So you want to make sure you keep them warm as best you can. That's why it's important to have something like a blizzard blanket, emergency blanket, wool blankets. Hand warmers are always great. Any method to keep warm. Hand warmers, make sure not necessarily skin to skin on the skin because it could burn. Maybe something in between that as a protective layer. All right, so that's pretty much those are the top five things we're going to cover. We're still going to go over a bunch of other supplemental stuff that's good to have. And then we have these first aid kits, these are for sale. And then we'll have other stuff from ANTHC, so supplies if you want to just stock up on your own. But has anyone ever heard of a trauma bandage? Israeli bandage, trauma bandage, they're very fun. Art, do you mind coming up here real quick? Heard them, but I've never seen them. Yeah, so these are cool. So it's, you know, you can tell these are made for the military because it's this other size port wound. So it's a big cloth size which you want towards the wound. And in case you get confused, it's labeled right there for you. So I have, um, yeah, you ready? You can open it up if you want. Good catch. Shane, you got it. Did you catch it? This is the abdominal one. Ah! You okay? All right, so look at that. You open it up. This is the other side toward the That's the abdominal one, which would be a little bigger. It goes on the abdomen. You're not going to put a lot of pressure on it. It's the abdomen. It houses a bunch of organs. So essentially, you're going to take it. You're going to see the wound. You're going to put that other side, that cloth side right there. And then you're going to wrap it. And it has that Velcro because it's helping stick right there. So you don't have to necessarily, that's if you don't have any tape, you can always tape it again. And it has a clip at the very end where you can clip it in. So essentially, you put one side through there, one side through there, and you're good to go. So say Mark was, Mark was wearing his scissors, hit his leg in his arm. You can essentially have gauze and then put this on top of the gauze and it holds pressure for you. So you don't have to worry about holding pressure. You get tired, start sweating, you're not in great shape like I am, can't hold pressure for that long. This does it for you. I have a good question here about these ace wrap type things. Um, do they, should they be tossed out and replaced periodically to start losing their elasticity if the Velcro stops? Working. I mean, are they still valuable? Because, like, what I do with the Velcro is not working anymore. It's just, you know, if I don't have tape. Yeah, absolutely. There's, so there's a bunch, bunch of things you can do. As I said, always check the expiration date. So, luckily, I still have a bunch of stuff when I left the army, so I'm able to take them out of the plastic and use them. I'm not going to leave them back in there. I'm not going to reuse them because they're just going to they're going to probably get go a lot bad worse. And there's this thing called like the shark. So, I would do is always check the expiration date. When you pull them out, if you have time to do a quick inspection, make sure everything's good. Be prepared to improvise. 
Like if it's a, a chance that it, if the Velcro is not working, make sure you have tape on hand. There's other things like it's called this is called a shark right. This is similar to an ace wrap. They're very difficult to work with, and you should have them prepped. This one's also expired, so I brought it today. So what would you call that? It's called a shark bite. That's the technical term. So uh, yeah. So it's co you know, coflex, coban, you know, you give your blood and they wrap it around pretty much put it on your arm. So it's like vet wrap? I'm not sure what vet wrap is, but it's pretty much that so essentially it's the exact same thing, but this can also act as a tourniquet. This can get that tight. So I don't want to ruin your shirt. But uh oh here, I don't want to do hair. So Pretty much, this, the, the, I'm just trying to show that there's a thousand things you can order and they're all ranging in price. So that's kind of expensive. This is very expensive and just gauze is cheap. But it's Coban, you put it on there and it sticks to itself the entire time. Can I check that? Absolutely, yeah, you can pass this around as well. So, the benefit to that is that it will stick to itself? Yeah, it sticks to itself constantly. So have you ever given blood? Yeah. Have you ever given blood? So when you have that coban, that stuff that you how they just put on your arm that holds everything in place. It's the exact it's the exact same material, but it's it's very sticky and it sticks to itself. Yeah, that's exactly oh, yeah. what that trap is. Probably not as sticky. Like that's like that's that expired. Was, so I would say expired, that's probably why it's more sticky. All right, and this one is the abdominal one I was talking about. Again, always has that very other side towards wound. In the abdomen, you're gonna have a big area to cover. So with the abdomen, if you have bleeding, are you gonna to want to put a lot of pressure on it? No, you're not. So this is kind of where it's a nice big pad. You can have it doubled up, or if it's a big area, you can have it just singular. So you're gonna put it on, you're gonna lightly wrap. Gonna, if they can lay down, you're gonna have them lay down. And what's something you think you could do to get that pressure off the abdomen? Have them flex their knees. Kind of bring their knees close to the chest. Up, yeah, yeah kick the, bring their knees close to the chest kind of takes a lot of pressure off that stomach. Okay. So there's a bunch of things you can do. This is the abdomen. It's the exact same thing as this. You can take it off if you want. And so if there's an extensive abdominal wound and you have intestines hanging out and guts. Yeah, so yeah, and so the fancy words exactly says it's called an abdominal visceration. So um, for the most part, I don't think I can leave it. Just don't touch them. Just cover them as best you can um, and just pray help gets there soon. Um, but there's also one thing you can do is if what would you want to do with maybe their head placement on that one? Lower. You want to turn it to the side because it's pretty nasty. You want them to vomit and aspirate and choke. So turn their head to the side as best you can. Away from you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Away from you too. That's a big one that's definitely understated. So, yeah, so that's pretty much. Just kind of a quick overview, five things if you could have them in your first aid kit or just put them in your car, put them in the backpack that goes up to the school. That's what kind of we're going over today. Do you have any questions for me? Burn. Yes, what about them? So what's the first thing you want to do in the event of a burn? Probably want to get them away from the source of the burn itself. So you want to get, say they're on fire or where it's coming from, you want to get them away from the burn. There's also things with the uh, burns can happen not just from fire, but what else? Steam. Steam. Chemical. Chemical and electrical. Those are the big areas. The chemical steam. So electrical burns are very dangerous because in an electrical burn, there's also, you can see on their hand. And so an example is we had a, an individual in Afghanistan who got a shot, grabbed his fence, didn't realize it was a high voltage fence, went through his hand. What happens with electricity? And it's, went out his foot. Went out his foot. And burn a hole all the way through to the foot. And yeah, he has all that internal damage. And his, we were able to, to there's, if there's an entrance, there's going to be an exit most of the time. So he came out his foot, and remember, we were treating him, we looked at his calf. His calf was bruised and it was terrible. And it was, it was a nasty mess. And it came out his foot, and his back, the bottom of his foot was almost blackened. It was in between his big toe and the toe right next to it. I don't know the name of all the toes, I'm sorry. But um, so that was something as a burns we didn't realize, oh, there's gonna be an exit, so you have to treat for that. But then from the hand all the way to the foot, there's so much in there that you had to treat for, uh, so it's a acute or rapid ketoacidosis. So essentially you have to put, and this is more of just a story than what you should do, but you have to push a ton of fluids, you're treating for acute acid, uh, ketoacidosis, which happens a lot in CrossFitters, which I am not. 
Um, so that's just something that happens. Burns. Burns are very tricky and always the source is very important. If it's electrical, you're looking for something like that. Chemical, you got another type of chemical because it could be a reaction, so what you put on it. Um, fire. You don't are, have to worry about yourself and treating someone with chemical uh, burn because you could also get that chemical on yourself and then you're making yourself use Absolutely. You have to be, that's that whole thing about assessing the whole situation. If it's a chemical burn, you probably have to put on different gear to be able to help that. And we, we call it BSI for my buddy and I, body substance isolation. That's why you have things like CPR masks. So yeah, chemical burns, make sure, and in all the situations, you probably wear gloves. I probably, you really should wear gloves. But BSI, body substance isolation for my buddy and I. It's not just for them, it's for you as well. And then uh, fire burns or thermal burns, those are also very dangerous. The skin gets very weak. And those, when the skin's affected, it depends on what the grid is. What's one of the biggest things we're worried about as well, once, it, once they're out of, out of the fire? Absolutely. Infection. Sure thing anybody gets burned any of those ways, doesn't happen instantly, but they will go into shock. Yes. The worse the burns, the more severe the shock. And the quicker. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and also because it, it de also dehydrates you. They're going to need a lot of fluids. And if they can drink by the mouth, absolutely. But how should you think you should give them fluids? Okay. Well, if they can drink it orally. You want them to sip it slow. You don't want them to give them Pedialyte and have them chug it the next time they're throwing up Pedialyte. You want to have them slowly sip fluids. Other than the chemical burn, you want to leave all their clothes on, leave them intact. Yeah, you want to leave them intact. You also don't, yeah, because then you also don't want to expose them to the elements. You want to be able to identify where the, and the, you're not going to try and pull the clothing out of the wound itself. They're going to have a bad day. And so if you're in a situation where there's burns, you have to be prepared for the smell. I, I did a rotation at the burn ward at uh, Bansy. And it's Brook Army Medical Center, or no, it's And it's one of the worst smelling places in the world. But burns, they're going to be in a lot of pain. And you're going to make sure that don't remove the clothes, don't rip the clothing out. Shoot you can to get them out of the source, get them in a place where they're able to stay warm and get help. Like Shannon said, chemical burns, make sure that you're not putting yourself in a situation where there's going to be not one, but two injured people. Awesome. Thank you. Here, regardless what they say, for, for a fire burn, you don't touch their clothes and you pour water on them. No matter what, how dirty the water is, you pour water on them. You get to the people at the hospital to deal with the mess that's made. That's, that's the big thing. So do you have any questions about anything else? Anything else you want to learn? Any other considerations or any injuries you've seen in the area that we haven't really talked about that hopefully I have some information on? I've only had to respond to a few really bad situations ever, and one was someone getting hit by a car on a bicycle a few years back here, and the other one was a bird. And I was one of the first people on the scene with Jan Yeager, and um, I just happened to be there. You know, I'm not one of the EMT group, but um, I just acted as her gopher. You know, I said, what do you need me to do, Jan? Because she was an EMT is an EMT and first responder. So, um, you know, we talk about a lot when you're doing first aid CPR, assessing the situation, but calling for help. And in that case, there was two of us there. And so I was the one that was able to do the calling for help and she was able to um, administer the first aid. And I was just her assistant, you know, just tell me what you need. Tell me who you want me to call, you know. And uh, it's, you know, both of those situations we had to have People, I mean, both of those situations, you had uh, lay people that were not first responders right there in this situation of first responding. So I think it's important to give clear directions if you're the first responder to any bystanders that might be there. Um, in the situation with the bike and car situation, it was a while before the ambulance got there. I mean, not a long while, but there was a while before the ambulance got there and those of us that were there had to immediately take action and secure the scene because it was in the middle of Jack Lock Bay Road. And we had to make sure that other cars were going to come up on the scene and, you know, let this person know. No, no, was in the, we're, we're laying in the middle of Jack Lock Bay Road. And then you have to know something when you respond. Know your limitations. That's the biggest thing. You're not going to do anything uncomfortable. You're, you're not really sure if you can do. You have to know your limitations because, what like you said, you're supposed to do no harm. They're already having a bad day, don't make it worse. And also, 
the really big thing and it kind of touched on it is crowd control is important. If you if you don't know what you don't have much you can bring, but you can maybe like take notes or kind of quick control individuals. You also have to make sure like don't crowd the individual. You know, the scenes in the movie where there's someone hurt and there's a thousand people around it. That's not helping the situation. Maybe take away from the scene, stop cars, and all that personal work. Awesome. Is there anything else? Yeah, this may be a little bit beyond the scope of what you're trying to do, but I, I'm curious about some of the things that, like, say we have a real emergency, we're cut off from a lot of medical people. Um, for example, deep cuts. You know, I know we're how to stop the bleeding, whatever, but is there a way that you can? Temper. Can you can you use glue? Can you do stitching that way? I'm I'm wondering. Can I ask you personally? Yes. yes. So I'm technically I'm in, so the military is that you become your EMT on a civilian side, and then when you go like so when I was in Afghanistan, I carried ketamine, fentanyl, everything like that. I was able to do so. Yes, I could. Here, no, I don't think the scope is in that area. And if we get online with a medical provider, Val, my wife is the MA, and they're at the clinic. I believe you can mark correct if I'm wrong. Under the guidance and supervision of telemedicine, she could possibly do stitching, correct? Potentially. Potentially. And that's all about her training level and the provider. And then, honestly, if like I get cut and I have what's called Dermabond, which is the super clue you're talking about, I have Dermabond. If I'm cut, I can use Dermabond myself. I can't sue myself anyway. I wouldn't make any money. Um, so, but then I, that's not, I would not do that to anyone else. So, yeah, it's kind of a rare, it's like the legality of the situation as well. We get into that legality. I think every time we do a CPR first aid class about um, EpiPens, because you know, technically speaking, unless someone has their own EpiPen, unless you're, um, you know, a qualified medical provider, EMT, or whatever, you're not supposed to use epinephrine on someone without knowing their history and whether or not they need it. So, in theory, if someone has their own EpiPen and you know that they need it, you can give them their own EpiPen. But we went, ran into this in schools all the time as kids' EpiPens are kept in the nurse's office in the office, and you know, you need them within a few minutes um, if they're having a strong allergic reaction. So um, on an ambulance, you have that, that and that ability to do it, but I've heard people say, I knew someone needed an EpiPen and I had mine and I used it on them. And that, yeah, and that's always going to be a situational scenario. Mm -hmm. So, and it's also kind of like what the person's comfortable with. It's always about like what comfort risk are they taking? Right. So, if they're comfortable using their EpiPen on someone else, knowing that they could get in trouble, that's a, that's a, that's a situational call. Right. Yeah. So, if someone gets seriously skewered by an arrow or a hook or something, is it really easy to pretend until they get somewhere else? Yeah, I would leave it in a, a lot of medical professional. So Steve Rowan's a great example. He took a barb to the chest, and I said what ultimately killed him was the fact that he ripped it out. You can do a significant amount more damage taking something out, and also, when it's in there, what's it doing? It's going to seal it's it off. Sealing it's sealing it off. It's preventing an area for the blood to come out of. Yeah. Also, you got to take your photos. You got to get some cool photos of it. It's a joke. Please don't take that seriously. But yeah, if there's an arrow or a barb, don't take it out, because there's a situation, say it's like a large fishing hook, they might have to surgically remove it. And that might be the safest option. And Boom. fishing hooks are legit here. I mean, yeah, I oh, yeah. ask the medical providers how many fishing hooks they deal with, you know, regularly. Yeah, and that's the thing is like, you might have to surgically remove it, which means you have to cut the skin and pull it out, which we're not gonna do here. It's not gonna kill them to leave it in. But yeah, so, just, so yeah, so that's something to look at is, good, that's a good question. Leave it in until a responder on the scene can get there. Even if even if it's in the eye, anything like that, just leave it in. Awesome. Great question. Any other questions? Awesome. All right. Round of applause for Mark. Thank you so much. All right. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the food. And uh, next month, we look forward to seeing you, everyone. Wheel of Names. Wheel of Names. Yes, we have four eligible individuals for the Wheel of Names. The prize is a life straw pack. Oh, I don't even realize I was up here. All right. John is going to call it out. If you have any needs for any first aid information, please feel free to stop by, ask questions. I'll be happy to help. How was the soup? Excellent. I cannot wait. It's ran out. Ran out? I 
saw you get what three or four bolts. <laughs> All right, click the spin. Let's see what happens. Oh, <laughs> John's our winner. Awesome. We won't say that was rigged at all, I promise. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. We appreciate your time. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Come talk to me right around the corner up in that office. Thank you. Thank you.